This is not a totally objective interview. I've been working with Boss for the last two years on uh, the show you saw clips at the end of, which was The Get Down. And I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Uh, but I thought, as you know, Baz is a master of using music, cinema, image, and melding. And in light of the passing this week of uh, Prince Rogers Nelson, I was looking online today and I realized that one of the major sequences in Romeo and Juliet uses when doves cry. So I think we kind of start talking about why you chose that song. Did you talk about what the scene is, why you chose that song, and how was it working with Prince? Oh, uh, I think from day one, mainly because of my upbringing in the theater and, and in a classical storytelling sense, music to me has always been text. We right. talked about it, right. Nelson. We talked right. about it a lot right. when we started doing the get down. That is that music can be used in storytelling as background. It can be used to support. But in a music-driven storytelling piece, it's used as text, like it advances the plot. And, and Romeo and Juliet was a really extraordinary journey alone because I set out to look at, you know, if Shakespeare were making a film, how might he go about doing that? So I spent years doing a kind of, I mean, I was already pretty steeped in the world of Shakespeare and, and how he went about making plays, but I spent a lot of time researching that. So despite what some, you know, analysts say, oh, you know, the MTV, Romeo and Juliet, all the choices were made based on things that happened in the Elizabethan theatre. Now, one of the things they did in Shakespeare's time was it would have taken a popular song of the time and put it right in the middle of the play, mm. like a, ball a balladeer when you take that song and use it to advance the story. So um, I was really committed to that, also because the language is musical. Iambic is musical. So, you know, it had to sit in with this musical language. And um, when Craig Pierce and I started working on the text, we didn't write the adaption and then go, gee, what song will we put in it? We wrote, and a choir boy sings a a cappella gospel version of When Doves Cry. Mm. So we wrote it into the script. And then kind of think of getting it, because at that stage I was like this, you know, I sounded a bit more like I did in that video, you know, hi, I'm Bess Lim, and I'm directing Strictly Ballroom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of reached out to Prince, and hi, I'm Bess Lim, and I'm going to be like, this <laughs> does cry. And, and yeah, that, in that, in, at that time, it was just a, a moment of, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, and I got a lot of good support, and he said, yes. However, there is a tag to this story, which is one of the great sadnesses that, that I've been reminded of with the with the passing of Prince is that on Gatsby, where I had a considerably deeper relationship, having worked through Moulin Rouge, having worked with so many great artists, um, both on an intimate level, in the studio, having learned to produce, because I've made a lot of music, I was working with Prince on a song for Gatsby. And it was a re-imagined uh, version of uh, a song he did with Matika called Love Though Will Be Done and it was going to be a major piece in it. And we did work on it. I mean, he was in Australia touring, we did some work there, we did further work on it. In fact, we worked on it a lot. Mm. And there just came a moment when he couldn't quite, it's a co-owned piece, and he couldn't quite get it released. And at that stage I had to make another decision and so I went and I worked with Lana Del Rey to do the piece we did, which ended up being that sequence. Beautiful song. But, uh, yeah, but yeah. you know, working with him, I mean, he is as he appears to be. <laughs> That's a sound effect. <laughs> was that a motorbike? I don't know what it was, but it was well. definitely present. Um, anyway, working with him, and you know, he is what he appears to be, just one of a kind. Like, there's only, you know, there's yes. only Prince, and it's a great sadness that... Hey, you know, can you talk a little bit about that particular arrangement? Because it's very radically different. Yeah. And it speaks to, I think, your way of hearing music in general? Well, well, I particularly, I mean, the whole thing with Romeo and Juliet was, uh, I mean, being inspired by Shakespeare, that he wasn't thematically consistent. You know, if you look at Romeo and Juliet in an Elizabethan sense, it opens with stand-up comedy. I mean, the two comics would come on and go, gee, bite your thumb at me, sir, you know, and then it would go into, you know, high tragedy. There would be music, uh, there would be poetry. You've got to remember, Juliet was played by a boy. So there was, a, there was a contract with the audience right. 
about the gear shifts. It wasn't the sort of drama we're used to, where you're either in a comedy, or you're in a tragedy, or you're in a, a you know a thriller. So this gear shifting thing was a, was a conundrum. And what I wanted to do was signal to our audience that you could take something you knew and interpret it in a different way so that it delivered a different emotional content. Like Doves Cry, the original one, you know, can you believe that guitar? Imagine it now. Amazing. Uh, you know, but it was such a great driving, mm. sexy, right. you know, it was a dance track. And well, we, so what if you took that iconic dance track and made it into this kind of pure religious um, wedding song? Mm. So it's looking at something, turning it over, and using it and, and interpreting it in a different way. So one of the, the big revelations, uh, as you re referenced it earlier, was text. Yeah. As a writer on the Get Down, one of the revelations the writers had mm -hmm. was that we never were writing scripts. We're writing text. We're like, okay, what does that mean? In the Boz world, which I've entered for the last two years, uh, the script is, a, is, I think you call it a map. Well, I, well I, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. look, I had great reverence. I mean, reverence, mm. I mean, first of all, we've got an extreme, I mean, everything on the get down, as you well know, Nelson, has been, whatever we thought we were getting into, it, it was like every corner is a surprise. There was no, there is no precedent for what we're trying to make, and in fact, what we're making. One of the great joys, um, amidst many joys and lots of labor, is the um, writing team and the vast and the breadth of experience and the kind of writers like the good self, you know, Stephen Allegogus, who is a, the way to say it, is a unique human being. Yes, and a Pulitzer uh, Prize winner. Well, you know, uh, you know, but, you know, you know, Aaron Thomas, Seth Rosenfeld, you know, um, you know, when I think about the team and more, but the team of writers, there's also the music writers right. and bringing them together to make, I mean, the text is a map because where, I mean, it's it's very, very evolved map, but I think the way I like to describe it is that where I tend to want to go, it's like Columbus and America. We kind of know it's out there across the ocean somewhere. Uh, we got this map, someone drew it. Let's get a crew together and some supplies and wish us luck. But you know, you know, the thing with the stars, I think we're supposed to turn left here, you know? And, and I only say that because, because where I tend to want to go, there is no real precedent for it. And, and I'll say, when we started working on the show, I got a copy of, from you guys of the Mullen Rouge script. Because I, 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 right. I didn't understand how you wrote, how do you write that kind of thing? And now I realize that you don't write that kind of thing. It, it, it evolves mm -hmm. out of a process and I think uh, one of the words that, that you use all the time is musicalization. Sure, yes. So could you tell, talk to me about what that means? I sure can, yeah. yes. Uh, <laughs> Nelson? <laughs> um, what musicalization is this? Is, and I mean, I, I don't even know if it's a real word, but, <laughs> but it's certainly real for us. And what it is is, we set out, we do the underlying carriage of the structure of the story. So it's, and it's usually universal. These, the stories I tend to work on, because they're using music to express an emotion or amplify a feeling, tend to be classical structures. So we've got that, then we've defined character and so on and so forth. Now, now, musicalization is you've written a scene, you know this, Nelson, because you went through it, but I sort of assume everyone understands it. It takes a long time to actually wrap your head around. And that is that if, in, in the most basic sense, if it's a music-driven piece of storytelling, the music has got to advance the plot and the character's emotional state. Right. So instead of saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, you sing it. Right. Now, if you or don't, rhyme it. Or rhyme it. Or if you don't break out into song and you're using a track, then the music has to Greek chorus, comment on it, right. you know, connect to disparate sequences and have some kind of extra layer of expression that is in concert with what's going on between actors. So, oh, that is now just too complicated, but the, the whole idea is you say, well, you've got to dramatize this, and how do you do it musically? So let, let's use an example for the audience. I, 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 was, I went with Mul Moulin Rouge today, and uh, there's this fantastic sequence of a tango dance right. where you have 
I sucked three things along. You yeah, had yeah. the actual tango. Yeah. Which, it's a, so you have the the, uh, the the drama of the tango, which is basically a sort of a menage that turns into almost like an orgy, in a sense, right? Am I right? There's an orgy in Moulin Rouge. <laughs> well, <laughs> Are you sure you saw my film? I, I think so. <laughs> but John Houston has a <laughs> so, so there's this dance, ama amazing dance sequence. At the same time, uh, Ewan McGregor is pining for <laughs> Nicole Kidman, and mm -hmm. he's kind of in an interior monologue about his drama. Mm -hmm. And he's with the tango, but he's also kind of in his own universe. Yes. And then you have a separate drama happening where you have uh, the Duke has, yes. has Nicole Kidman for dinner. Yes. And he's about trying to seduce her. Right, yeah. Right. So yeah. these three things are all weaved around yes. um, Roxanne, by the way. Yes. And I, I think there's also a, a tango. Or a very famous, yes, you're quite right. And you remind me, a very famous tango, right. which we reinterpolate and weave through it. Yeah. So one of the things that, that it seems like it's a consistent thread, and I know this is something, again, had no experience to, on the get down. How, this, this idea of the weave, it's a huge part of your storytelling style. And I'm just curious about what are the... Because it's, it's very unique. No one well, does this anymore. Right, right. you know what? Yeah. what um, Nelson, I mean, I'm hearing his back from you. And okay. I, it's somewhat inherent, but it's very technical. Right. But someone like Mozart, right. in writing an opera, because I had a big opera background, would have gone... I mean, if you've ever seen Amadeus, there's that scene... I don't know if you've ever seen that film. It's about Mozart. Yes. Right? yes <laughs> okay. All right. It's available on DVD. In the foyer. Not that he sells DVDs anymore. Download it on Netflix. The thing is that, <laughs> that in that, it's a great interpretation. I mean, as biography goes, I don't ever really believe. Biography is never really the telling of a character. It's the expression of some sort of universal. It's using someone's life as a canvas right. to express a larger idea. In the case of Amadeus, it's really about... Jealousy in the Salieri. Having said that, there's that great scene, and I think it's pretty credible, where Mozart's there with the Duke, you know, and he's commissioned to write Marriage of Figaro, and he's going, Sire, Sire, how many characters do you think are singing at once? And this is something that music can do, mm. that drama can't quite do in the same way, and that is that you can have four or five, either, you know, two or three characters or two or three storylines mm. where the music is allowing them to cross-fertilize each other. So you, you understand, for example, the one we were working on last night, one character is desperately trying, desperately trying to find this bootlegged tape, and the other character is desperately, he's got writer's block, trying to write a disco song, and he's taking copious amounts of drugs and banging his head against the piano. Now, musically, we bind these two things together. But what are they both sharing? Desperation. Two characters, two storylines, one emotional state. So the banging of the piano is the underlying rhythmic score to the and his kind of repetitive tune to this other musical drama of him searching for the cassette. It's a, it's a minor example, but that's kind of something that music can do dramatically that you can't quite do when it's just straight drama. So one of the other things you've, you've talked about, uh, we've talked about in, uh, in conversation, is uh, the idea of cinema of expression versus cinema of realism. Sure. And what you do is, I, I think you said to me, you, you feel like you do a throwback in a sense. You're, do, you're not doing mm. naturalism. You do something more in ken with, I don't know, a 40s director. Am I misstating? Well, I thank close. you. Yeah. <laughs> 40s director. You mean like Olson Wells? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we used, we used uh, I think, I think Susan Cain. Well, no. Uh, here's the, here's the yeah. thing, and, and yeah. it, it's come up. I mean, I'm right. old now, so <laughs> so I am had to actually accept that when people ask you enough, why is that so, kind of think about it. And by the way, I grew up dramatically because I had theater companies, I did opera companies, I you know did lots of stuff. I was a pretty pretty energetic young fellow, and I did lots of things, and I did psychological drama, a lot of it, and I was trained in it. And by the way, I love psychological dramas, just for the record. You know, I was only saying the other day, a film like Spotlight is so beautifully observed. It's so beautifully acted. What that is, is that you as a, a, a viewer are somewhat put to sleep. It's keyhole drama. You're looking, you're forgetting yourself, you're observing the drama, and you're meant to forget your presence, but most importantly, 
the storyteller's presence, the filmmaker's presence. You're meant to just sit in on their lives. That's it. That's what I call psychological drama. Now, what's interesting, and I love it, and um, what's interesting is that it came in a great, I mean, it's existed before, but it came as a reaction, particularly in the 70s, the French New Wave, all of that, against this kind of artificial drama of which Orson Welles or Citizen Kane or, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or musicals. Or you, because the way that those films work is completely different. You know, the, you, you are aware that you're participating with the storyteller in a journey. And, you know, they're, they're not, you're not meant to be looking through a keyhole at, at realism. The real interesting thing, which came up the other day with you when you brought it, and I thought, that's probably true, is why? And what happened to me was I grew up in a very isolated place, tiny country town, and at one stage we had the cinema, because the fellow that get, brought gasoline to us, because we had a gas station and a farm and shops and, you know, was mad. my brother had grew, you know, flowers. <laughs> Such a lovely guy. And I read fish and, you know, it was madness. I didn't hear it was, but we did a lot of things. But at one stage, the guy that supplied gasoline, he, he passed away. And my father was in the Vietnam War. He knew how to thread film. He, he, he taught me photography. He was obsessed with photography. He met my mother through photography. So anyway, we ran the cinema. And we were, I was like literally sort of cinema paradiso style, watching <laughs> movies come out of cans and sitting in the bio box and all that. But at the same time, we had this one black and white television and we lived in the middle of nowhere, so it only had one channel. And they gave away what they considered junk movies, like for nothing. Now, in the 70s, junk movies would be something like the Red Shoes, or Citizen Kane, or, or you know, the Young Lions. So I was fed at a very early age on these kind of heightened, the heightened cinema that was, that was being reacted against as I was growing up, you know, like the 70s had come along, the new wave and all of that. So I think it left a kind of sense of, they're, they're romantic in the sense of their amplifications, they're expressionistic, and I think I got lumbered with that one. Well, also, I mean, you don't leave out bars radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you have a thing about the child, child. I'm never telling you anything again. <laughs> Didn't you have a childhood radio station? I trusted you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, well, it was very isolated, and and my father encouraged all sorts of different creative folk to come and live with us. Like, there's a painter live with us. I don't say it's bonkers, but. It's, totally happened, and we were kind of the Renaissance players of Heron's Creek, you know? So we'd be doing ballroom dancing, riding horses, scuba diving, commando training, you know, and learning to paint, you know? But um, at one stage, yeah, it's about music, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, at one yeah. stage, um, Nelson said, when did you ever have your first, buy your first record? I said, well, someone threw away a, a record player, and I got the record player and rigged it up to speakers, at the gas station, and there were these three records, the two I can't remember, but one was called One is the Loneliest Number by John Farnham. Right. And I just played it over and over again, I had a microphone going, hey, welcome to Radio M-O-B-I-L. Let's get that hot wax. Just <laughs> only go round and round and round and round. And then I eventually got my little brother to break up the program, to come in and read the paper about sports, because he was a sports reporter. But yes, I had my own radio station. Well, and you know why this is very interesting is because one of the shocking things of watching you direct, particularly the music sequences, which are elaborate and amazing on our show, is that Boz, he doesn't, he DJs the shoot. Okay, so we're there, there's dancers, and he's on the mic, yo, 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 let's go, rock, rock. He's, he's giving high energy MC all night, I mean, I'm talking about for hours, because we have dancers. You do that much better than me, Nelson. But you're going for it, man. And, and also, so, and literally, he, he, the, he's, he, he's like he's a DJ or an MC at a party of his own shoot. And so when we do, when you look at the big dance numbers, which you're not going to, which you're going to miss out on, unfortunately, is Boz's commentary well, during the shoot of, yeah, that girl in the red dress, let's go! <laughs> I, I never said anything to a Sam. I was professional. Um, actually, it's for a very good purpose, because one of the things about shooting large party sequences, or sequences with lots of what people refer to as background, I have a rule, there is, there is no background in my films. And there are no extras and actors. Everybody's acting. 
So the first thing I do is I do that and I put myself on the line because what I really want is everybody to, tr A, not to be scared of the stars. One of the things that happens on set is that if Jimmy Schmitz is there or it's Leonardo, all of the people in the crowd scene sort of walk like, it's him, you know? And, and I want them to go up and touch him and grab him and, and really be visceral in the scene. So I do do that and I think it's my job to lead with energy, and if I can kind of be foolish and fearless, then, you know, the the um, actor in this tiniest role down at the back holding the, you know, tinsel, they can be fearless and foolish. So I really want the audience to believe that that party scene is very real. Now, actually on the Gatsby ones, which were so elaborate, I did it very traditionally like that, but I have to say that when we got done, Dio Leonardo would come down and he would sit there. I got all the cameras cranked up, and then I just put on these giant, you know, rolls, and we cranked up the music. We let people have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Went on for a long time, got very out of hand. <laughs> but, but I only did that at the end, after everyone's learned how to be wild and crazy. You know? uh, but there's, sort of, there's one moment, I, 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 amazing moment. There's a sequence you saw in that little trailer of a gentleman in a white suit dancing. Mm -hmm. When you get downstairs, his character's name is Cadillac in the, in the show. And so one of these nights, they've been dancing for hours and hours. Uh, and um, something happened that was like one of those things that doesn't, you don't think about it as a movie scene, you think about it as something that happens in theater, I guess, or on a concert, uh -huh. where the actor Boz is, you know, gassing him up all night. The audience is thought he's getting, he just kind of went off book or something, and magic happened, and he actually became John Travolta. Yeah, he literally did. It, it was like, and everyone in the room, the, even, the, even the board cameramen, everyone's like, "What the fuck just happened?" <laughs> and it was a magical yeah. thing, and it partly because the environment that is created was not of a sterile. We're going to shoot this thing and get it. It was a party. Well, Nelson, yeah. good point, because because <laughs> Shakespeare would say we are players. You know, it's called a screen play. Right. It's not called a screen work, it's called a screen play. You know, you are play acting. So there's a lot, a lot of work that has to happen. Right. But if you get the environment right, at some point, play, the play within all of us, particularly within actors, can take over. And there's this magical thing, you can get it so far, but there's this absolutely magical thing, which is kind of like surfing on top of it, where neither the actor, nor the director, nor anyone in the room is actually in control of it. It's some sort of moment, and if it happens, and it doesn't always happen, right. but if it happens, you know it's happening. And it's this play, and it kind of sits somewhere between the technique and the story you're telling and everything there, and it just happens. And we all know it. You, the, yeah. we, we were all like, mm, John Travolta. It was, it, was, it was amazing. So, uh, 